Okay, hello everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started. Welcome to the Is CAP a Good Fit for My Institution webinar. My name is Tiffany Amick and I'm the CAP Program Coordinator here at the Foundation of the American Institute for Conservation, also known as FAIC. I'm joined today by our CAP Program Assistant, Liz Hanberg kurt We're going to be moving back and forth today. Liz and I will hear from both of us and hopefully um, you won't get tired of our voices. Um, if at any time in the future you want to talk specifically about your institution and the CAP program, please feel free to contact either one of us by email or by phone. Our information is listed here, but it'll also pop up again at the end of the webinar and you can also find it on the website. So just a couple of uh, technical notes before we get started. On your screen, you'll see several boxes. Um, the one labeled chat on the left-hand side of your screen, I notice many of you have found, which is great. You can continue to use that box to say hello, ask questions, um, share information throughout the webinar. If you do post a question, you'll receive a response from one of us, but it may not be right away. Um, sometimes when we're in the middle of a discussion, it's a little bit easier for us to just kind of tag that question and then come back to it at the end. So you'll also see a web links box down at the bottom which contains a few links to the program website and also to um, the online application portal which is not open yet but we wanted to make sure you have that link and we'll talk about that in a minute. The other box at the bottom has CAP files um, and importantly there is a CAP sample application. Oh, we'll talk about that later as well, um, but it should give you a good um, overview of some of the questions that you will find on the CAP application. Today's webinar is being recorded, so if you're not able to attend the entire session or you want to view information again or share it with a colleague, We'll post the session on um, our website, and um, if you would like us to send you a link to that website, just send us an email. We'll try to get that uploaded to the website within the next couple of days. And then we had one pull up earlier, um, but just to get a little bit more information about who's joining us today, I'm going to add a couple more polls for you here. Um, the first one asks what type of museum you work for. So you can select the, the type that best describes your museum. And then I'll share you with you the answers in just a minute. Oh, it looks like I'm already doing that, so you can see how others are answering. Great, it looks like a lot of history museums, some um, art museums, historic homes, um, natural history museums and other, which always makes me curious. All right, thank you. And then we're going to do one more. Just asking, where are you from? So let us know what region of the country you're from, um, if you're from the U.S., which I suspect many of you are. It looks like we have some pretty good even distribution here from around the country, which is great. And we welcome all of you. Okay. Thank you. So today we want to spend some time talking about the CAP program and hopefully giving you a better understanding of whether this may be a good program that can help your institution either this year or in the future. Um, we're going to start by talking about the program in general, um, talk about the CAP process um, and how CAP can help your institution. Then we're going to talk about eligibility, how to know if you are eligible to participate. We'll talk about funding, which is always exciting. Um, and then just briefly talk about whether this may be the right time for you to apply. And then at the end, um, I'll talk through some just more concrete tips about applying for CAP. And then at the end, we'll have time for Q&A. And again, 
please feel free to ask questions as we go along using that uh, chat box on the left hand side of the screen. We may not answer your question right away, but we will get to it. All right, I'm going to turn it over to Liz to start talking about um, a, a general summary of the CAP program. Thank you. Um, so again, my name is Elizabeth, and today I want to start by describing a bit about the CAP program and the CAP process. CAP is a program that's administered by the Foundation for the American Institute for Conservation, or FAIC, and it is through a cooperative agreement with the Institute of Museum and Library Services, or IMLS. It's designed to help small and mid-sized museums by providing funding support for a general conservation assessment. CAP is often the first step for a small uh, museum who wants to improve the condition of their collections and develop long-range preservation plans. CAP can also serve as a wonderful fundraising tool for future collection projects, and it can provide a really valuable tool for engaging your board, leadership, and other community partners. So what does a general conservation assessment consist of? The general conservation assessment is a review of all the institution's collections, their buildings and building systems, as well as policies and procedures relating to collections care. This is not an item by item review of the collections, but rather more of a general sort of bird's eye view, an overview, if you will. The goal is to really help the museum determine their greatest collection care needs, and the recommendations can really help an institution design decide where they want to invest limited resources and time. So how does the CAP process work? Well, the most important thing is that this is really a team process. Most museums will have two assessors. One, the first assessor is usually has a collections background, usually a conservator. And the second assessor has a building background. They might be an architect or an engineer or a historic preservationist. And the two assessors will work collaboratively to create a prioritized list of recommendations for improved collections care. But the museum will also want to invite a number of staff and board members and volunteers to participate in various stages of the CAP process. And we really encourage this. The more people that you have involved early on in the process, and throughout, the more it's going to help both the assessors get a more complete understanding of your institution, and it's also going to be more likely that there is a lot of support and momentum for the implementation of the report. And the assessment will culminate with a final product that is a comprehensive report written by your assessors and with a list of prioritized recommendations for collections care. The CAP process takes about a year and is compromised of, or comprised, excuse me, of eight steps. I would like to describe briefly what each of those steps are going to entail. The first step is the application process. Those will be open from November 1st to February 1st, and the museums will be notified in March um, of their acceptance. Once accepted, the institutions will select their two assessors. We provide a list of approved assessors that they may both review and then decide who they want to interview and they'll go through the interview process. And um, once the assessors are selected, the museum will then provide them with some background information. This is in the form of a site questionnaire. We'll provide the museum with questions that ask specific things about the organization and their staffing their collections, such as what types of collections or how many they have and different in each type, their buildings and building systems, such as how many buildings they have, the size, the age, um, what they're used for, and then also their policies and procedures, such as mission statements, collections management, and emergency policies. But don't worry if you don't have all of these things. It, it's part of the CAP process that um, you determine what those sorts of needs are going to be. And ultimately, the site questionnaire helps the assessors get to know your museum. So as you near the site visit, the museum will then hold a pre-site visit phone call with the assessors. The goal of the call is to introduce members of the project team to one another 
and then allow the assessors to ask questions and get to know the institution and their goals and their concerns. It will also be a time for you to organize the schedule for the site visit and just do some of the preparatory work before that site visit. And we feel like this uh, conference call is really important because it helps the assessors really make the most of their time when they do have their site visit. And then the next step is the two-day site visit. During the site visit, uh, assessors will tour the collections, the buildings, exhibition spaces. They'll be looking at things like lighting in your building, storage materials you're using, layout, organization, environmental controls, security, pest management. They'll talk to staff. Um, they'll want to understand their roles as they're related to collections care. They might also look at things like HVAC systems, collections policies, and a variety of other things that will affect the preservation and care of the collections. And they'll also want to meet with staff members, board members, and maybe some other community partners to get a real comprehensive sense of your museum and your collections. And then this will culminate in a written report, which contains uh, prioritized recommendations from both of the con of both between your conversations you've had with the museum and then also from the site visit. They will pull all of that together into a prioritized list of recommendations um, for your museum. And then the staff should really begin implementing their report recommendations. And what we really hope with the CAP report is that it will serve as a real living, working document to help guide your museum in both the short and long term. And then approximately 12 months after the initial site visit, the institution will have the opportunity to consult with the assessors once again to report on progress to request further advice, um, address any challenges that may have arisen, and really to discuss their work over the last year. So that kind of gives you a nice general overview of the whole CAP process and um, the kind of course of events throughout the year that you'll have to go through. So next I wanted to give you a bit of an idea of some of the recommendations that you might find in a final CAP report. Every CAP report will contain an executive summary that serves as a prioritized list of recommendations. And though you may already be aware of some of these issues, the assessment can really help your institution decide where to invest both limited resources and staff time. And what you see here on this list is not a complete list of recommendations, um, nor are they all necessarily from one single report. But we just wanted to give you a sense of what types of things might be included in a report. So the first thing I want to point out is how they are organized and categorized. We think that having a prioritized list of recommendations is really important so that you don't feel overwhelmed with just this huge list of recommendations and you're not even sure where to start. It just really helps kind of create a sense of organization for the institution. And the example here has recommendations organized by critical, high, medium, and low priority. But other reports might use immediate, short, and long term as their designations, or one year, three years, or five years. There really are a lot of variations in how the assessors might organize their findings, which they base both on their own preferences and the needs of your institution. So here, what you see as recognized is maybe a couple critical needs, one of which is the need to create a written collections management policy. Now that one is a really important one because it can help guide your institution going forward. And it really helps when you're making your collections decisions. So it's really important. Oh, excuse me. The other critical thing that you see here is um, one of the examples was water infiltration into collections storage. The report will offer not just identifying some of these critical needs, but also offering ideas and suggestions for how to mitigate some of these problems. So in previous reports, we've seen things from, you know, needing a new roof or simply adding better gutters or changing the landscaping slightly so the water might drain away from the building better and you can mitigate those issues of water coming into the collections. And as you can see, as you move down the list, Fixing gaps around the windows, installing UV filters, rotating your, 
your objects on exhibit to help prevent with uh, light damage. It really is a large mix of things, some of which may require additional funding and fundraising, and others that may be things that you can easily do on your own at your institution. So how can CAP help your museum? There's many benefits to being part of the CAP program. And as busy professionals, we understand how challenging it can be to take a step back from the long list of day-to-day -day needs and projects that you have at your institution to really help create some long-range planning. And that is where CAP can really be a wonderful way to help you start that process. In addition, if you're interested in seeking grant funding or private support for conservation or preservation activities, a CAP report can really provide a great professional argument for the need for such work. Bringing in an outside consultant to identify a need can really help in adding that sort of much needed weight to a grant application or even create some community momentum for fundraising on your own. So having an outside perspective can also be really valuable in drawing attention to your board or other leadership and community partners to your collection care needs and help really engage them and again create that sense of momentum for addressing some of these concerns. So I've talked a lot about what CAP does, the process of it and its benefits, but I wanted to review quickly what CAP is not. So we unfortunately do not provide grant funding for collections care or for implementing your CAP findings. CAP also does not provide individual conservation treatments or object by object level surveys. CAP is really meant to be a broader look at the collections, the building systems and the policies and procedures. The program really emphasizes preventative conservation and what you as an institution can do to create the best environment for the items in your care. So with that, um, I'm going to hand it back to Tiffany. Um, she's going to be discussing eligibility and our upcoming program cycle and some great tips for applying. All right. Thank you, Liz. So what type of museums are eligible for CAP? Um, basically, any museum that um, calls itself a museum is eligible. So your um, art museum, your rare history museums, your natural history museums, um, anything that has the word museum in it is eligible. But also, um, places that hold collections, whether they're living or non-living, such as aquariums or arboreta, botanical gardens, um, zoos, planetariums, um, basically the, the rule is if you have collections and you make them available to the public, you probably are eligible. Um, one note here, um, unfortunately, libraries and archives are not eligible for CAP. Um, the reason being that the funding for the CAP program comes through IMLS um, through the Museum Services Division of IMLS. And um, so there are other opportunities for libraries to apply for similar types of programs, but the CAP program is primarily intended for museums. Now, if you are um, in a museum that has an archive, don't worry, you're eligible. If your uh, museum is called an archive, but you have a bunch of museum objects, just give us a call um, and we'll talk through your individual circumstances. Um, but you, you may or may not be eligible. Um, the other, uh, the other uh, criteria that museums have to follow are listed here. They need to be a unit of non-federal or tribal government or a nonprofit organization. They need to be located in the United States, but that includes all U.S. territories and districts. The museum needs to be organized on a permanent basis for educational or aesthetic purposes. It needs to own tangible objects and make them available to the public. One note here, there, you've probably seen other opportunities that require you to be open to the public for a minimum number of days. CAP does not have that requirement. Um, we say that you need to show a regular commitment to public access. Um, so if I come to your museum or if I call you, um, and say, hey, I want to check out your collections. 
you need to be able to tell me, okay, you can do that by fill in the blank. Um, or I need to be able to go to your website and see that you're open every Wednesday afternoon or whatever it may be. Um, so there's no minimum amount of time that you need to be open to the public, but you need to show regular public access. You also have to employ at least one full-time person or the full-time equivalent. Um, so that means if you have two part-time staff members, that's fine. If you're an all-volunteer organization, that's also fine, but we want to see that your volunteers are committing at least 40 hours a week to the museum. Um, the reason for that is that uh, after undergoing a CAP assessment, you'll leave with some comprehensive uh, recommendations, and we want to make sure you have the staff power to be able to implement those recommendations. Um, you also need to be of the proper size so that your collections and facilities can be reviewed by your assessors on a two-day site visit. Um, so we say that CAP is a program for smaller mid-sized museums, and this is how we define smaller mid-size. Can your assessors review all of your collections and facilities in two days? This, I understand, is, can be a little bit difficult to figure out. Um, we encourage you, if you're a concerned about the size of your institution to give us a call again. We'll talk through the details of your collection and your site. Um, but they do need to, your assessors do need to see all of the areas that hold um, storage of your collections and um, exhibition of collections. So that may include off-site storage. Um, that may include um, if you have permanent exhibition space that's not in your primary um, building your assessors would need to see that as well. So it really is an institution by institution decision. Who is not eligible for CAP? Um, agencies of the federal government, um, and again, that's because the funding for the program comes through IMLS, which is a federal agency. Institutions that primarily serve as a library or archive, we talked about that. Historic structures that don't have collections. So if you are um, just a historic building and there are no collection items beyond the building, um, then you would not be eligible for a CAP assessment. Also, if you don't own your own collections. Um, so if the objects in your collections are on loan, or if you are responsible as, as a nonprofit organization, for example, for caring for a set of collections, but those may be still in private hands, Unfortunately, you would not be eligible. It's absolutely fine if maybe one or, or two collections or you have um, items in your collection that are on loan. That's not a problem. But the majority of your collections you need to, um, you need to own. And then also institutions with collections that take more than two days to assess are not eligible, which we talked about earlier. So now the fun part, um, money. How much funding does CAP provide? So we talk about CAP um, providing allocations for assessors. Um, and those allocations are based on the size of your annual budget. Um, so for example, if your institution's annual budget is $150,000, you would receive, um, and you're accepted into the program, I should say, you will receive $3,900 per assessor um, so that's $3,900 to hire a collections assessor and $3,900 to hire a building assessor um, for the CAP assessment. Now, that's a little bit difficult for us um, to talk about because um, each individual assessor is able to set their own assessment fees. Um, they are all professionals outside of the CAP world. Um, they do similar general conservation assessments on their own, so they all have their own set fee structures. Um, and so, as Liz talked about earlier, um, each institution is responsible for interviewing and hiring assessors that are going to work well with their institution. During that interview phase, we ask you to talk directly to um, the potential assessor about what their fee structure looks like. Um, I have a sample. Uh, assessment cost written here. It's completely made up, um, so please don't use it as a, as a um, um, to assume that this is going to be um, what you'll see. But um, your, professor, your assessor may come to you and say, my professional fee is $3,900, but I'm going to need um, uh, additional funding to help me travel to your site 
um, because it's a two-day assessment, I'm going to need to stay at a hotel near you. Um, I'm going to have to take a train or fly or whatever, and those costs will add up to $500. So my total fee is $4,400. Um, FAIC would pay that assessor the $3,900 allocation, but your museum would be responsible for covering the remaining amount, which in this case would be $500. I took a quick look at the cost of assessments for the museums participating in the 2017 CAP program, and we have a range of um, folks paying anywhere from $0 to $4,000 for their CAP assessment in total. Um, on average, I would say that um, the average museum is paying around $700 total um, for both assessors out of pocket, and the rest is covered by the CAP assessment, or yeah, by the CAP assessment. So um, we do encourage you to budget some funding for CAP um, internally. Uh, we've had some really wonderful um, creative institutions uh, plan for CAP and fundraise for CAP. Um, some of them fundraised among their board or um, even among their members. Um, there are also creative ways to save money um, by, uh, we had one museum that had a board member who uh, managed a B&B. &B. And so she, that board member was able to donate uh, her B&B &B rooms to the assessors for the evening that they were in town so that that saved money for the museum. We're open to all sorts of things. Um, really, it's a conversation in terms of the, the fee structure is a conversation between museums that participate and the assessors that they choose. And again, you get to have that conversation before you enter into a contract with any assessors. So um, you're absolutely able to use that as a deciding factor in your selection. OK, so the next program cycle. Um, as Liz mentioned earlier, applications open November 1st, um, that's coming up, and um, applications will close February 1st of 2018, so that's a pretty long application window. Um, apply early. Um, this doesn't mean that you have to um, get up early on November 1st and start plugging in your um, application answers and trying to hit submit before the end of November 1st. Um, but we do give priority consideration to applicants who apply early. I'm going to talk about that a little bit more. Um, but first, I want to just um, help you think about whether this may be the right time to apply. Um, so as Liz said, the applications will close February 1st. Um, we will notify museums of their acceptance um, beginning on March 1st. And all of the assessment activities, that means the final report um, has to be completed, and everything that comes before that has to be completed before the end of 2018. So um, think about all the activities and all the things that you have on your plate right now, and um, please make sure before you apply that you're able to commit to the CAP process before um, the end of 2018. OK, so I'm going to move on to some um, top tips for applying to CAP. Um, I mentioned earlier that in the box at the bottom of the page, you can, um, you can navigate to our online application portal by clicking on that online application line and then clicking the Browse To button. Um, you, once you get there, you will see um, what, what you see right here on this slide. Um, which is a purple button in the center of the page. It says, begin or continue an application. Um, when, you're, when you um, build a, an account through our application portal, um, you'll be asked to, I'm going to switch to the next slide here. You'll be asked to enter a whole bunch of information as a new account on the right-hand side of the screen. So you have two options, log in or create a new account. You'll have to create a new account by logging in here and filling out a bunch of contact information. Um, when you do that, please uh, write down your login ID and password and, um, and, and keep that in a safe place um, because you're able to log out and come back as many times as you need to. 
Um, but in order to do that, and flip back to the following screen, you'll need to um, hit that button again on the CAP application portal and re-enter your login ID and password. If you do forget your password, don't panic. Um, you'll have to contact us and we'll be able to reset it for you. Um, the lost password information works uh, only sometimes, um, so really the easiest way is to just contact us. Okay. My next tip is to make sure you're eligible. Um, this, these questions that you see on your screen should all look familiar. They're questions that are listed on our application and they correspond to that eligibility criteria that I talked about a few minutes ago. Does your organization exist on a permanent basis for educational or aesthetic purposes? Do you own tan tangible objects, etc.? You need to be able to select yes for all of these answers. Um, however, don't select yes if you're not telling the truth. Um, if you have questions about them, about any of the eligibility criteria now before November 1st is a great time to ask us those questions. Um, but make sure that you can say yes to all of these before you go through um, the entire application process. My next tip is to rally your team. Um, by this I mean um, engage your colleagues, um, engage your board. On the application, we do require you to um, have a, a board president or a board leader sign um, a statement saying that they are aware that you're applying to the CAP program and they support the process. And the reason for that is we want to make sure that they are on board um, and that, that your entire team is on board for this process. Um, we feel like engaging your entire staff and, and everyone from the beginning is so helpful in ensuring that the report recommendations will be implemented in the future. Um, I also say rally your team when you're actually filling out the application. There are questions on the application that you may need to go to other uh, colleagues for. So questions about budget you may not know. Um, questions about um, the exact makeup of your, your um, collection, what kind of collection materials you have you may need to ask others for. Um, we provide the sample application in this files document at the bottom of the screen so that you have an idea of the kinds of questions that we'll be asking on the application and you can start dividing those, those questions up among your staff. So take advantage of that, ask for help. Um, again, the more people you can get involved, the better. My next tip would be to choose your project contact wisely. Um, Early in the application, we ask you to identify a project contact. So that should be a member of your staff or board who is going to be the contact with us. Um, please pick somebody who is in town, um, who's engaged, who's going to answer the phone and email. Um, if you know that um, uh, someone goes um, to uh, uh, Antarctica for three months out of the year and we're not going to be able to reach them, don't put them as the project contact. Um, my third tip, or my, I guess we're going backwards, so this is tip number four, but um, in reverse order, um, is to answer questions to the best of your ability. We tell you that right at the beginning of the application. Um, there are questions, we, we do our best to make sure that the questions are relevant to you no matter what kind of museum you, you work for. Um, if you're just not sure about how to interpret a question, don't hesitate to give us a call um, or shoot us an email. We'd love to answer questions, um, but uh, just do your best to answer the questions and, and don't stress about um, uh, writing. There are three open-ended questions in the application. Don't stress about um, you know, writing a, a three-page uh, answer to each of those questions. In general, a couple of paragraphs is is great um, and uh, do the best you can. And oops, sorry, the formatting is a little weird on this, but um, my next tip is to just be honest. Um, that should be obvious, um, but also not all questions address eligibility requirements. Um, I, I pulled up an example here. Does your organization own all of the land and buildings it occupies? Yes or no? 
Um, I had a museum contact me last year and say, oh, I was going to apply to CAP, but I saw this question and we don't, or we don't own the land that our museum is on. So I figured we weren't eligible. Um, that's not true. We ask a lot of, of questions in the application um, that we're just trying to understand um, your organization and your collections through these questions. It doesn't mean that you are or aren't eligible. Um, we're really just information gathering. So don't panic if you, you think you have the wrong answer. There are no wrong answers. Um, if you have a question, again, call us, um, but just be honest in the application. And then my final one is returning to my first tip, which is to apply early. Again, um, we expect to have funding to fund about 75 uh, museums throughout the country this year. Um, we never know exactly until we start drawing down funds um, because the allocations vary based on the size of the museums that are accepted. But um, uh, 75 is, is our target. Um, and it's possible that we would run out of funds before we hit the February 1st deadline. So please do um, apply early. Um, my, my warning on that is don't be sloppy. Um, if we have a question or, or some answer is unclear, or if you've missed sections of the application, we will pull your application out of the queue and come back to you with additional questions. And that's why your project contact and their responsiveness is so important. Um, so be careful um, with your application and be thoughtful with it, but um, don't put it off through uh, the end of January. Okay, I promised you I would leave um, the, our contact information up, and I will do that through our question and answer period, but I do want to just bring Liz back. Um, Liz is going to help me sort through the questions. I'm happy to see a bunch of questions coming in as we went along, um, and we'll We'll spend a little time on Q&A. Feel free to continue to answer questions or ask questions in the chat box there. All right. Um, so it looks like one of the first questions is, or we've gotten several questions relating to the two-day site visit. So how can you determine if your institution can be assessed within two days? Yeah, this is so tricky. It's a good question. Um, I would say, um, think about your collections, think about um, how many buildings you have, um, think about the amount of time that you will need to spend with your assessors um, meeting with them. And usually about half of the site visit is spent in meetings or interviews. Um, and, and we use that to think about um, whether your site is too big. Um, the other thing I would recommend is on the CAP webpage, you, um, you can see a list of 2017 CAP program participants. It may be helpful for you to go to that page and look at who's participating now. Um, obviously, all of those museums have been accepted, so we've decided that they're not too big. Um, so if you're familiar with those, uh, those museums and you can compare yourself to them, it may help. Um, Really, the best thing you can do is to give us a call. We'll ask you questions about um, your collection size, your building size, um, how much space you have dedicated to collection storage and exhibition. We'll probably ask about staff size and budget and all sorts of fun questions. But we can help narrow that down on a one-on-one -on -one basis because it really is kind of nebulous. Um, so we're happy to, to work with you one-on-one -on, -one on that. Sorry, I can't give you a more concrete answer. Um, and just for a little background, it, we think it wouldn't, it wouldn't be fair to say that um, only museums from a certain budget size would, would qualify because different types of museums differ so much. So think about what a small historical society would look like or a large historical society versus a large zoo. Um, because these different types of museums are eligible, it's really hard for us to um, define large in a way that, um, that represents all of the different types of museums that are eligible for the program. All right, so the next question we have is, if we are currently in an expansion, would you consider this a good time to do a CAP? Oh, good question. I, it depends on what kind of expansion you're doing. Um, and how far, far along you are. If your uh, collections are maybe off-site or being stored elsewhere during an expansion, um, maybe this is not the best time. 
Um, if you're an active construction type uh, site, it may not be the best time because it's going to be hard for your assessors, especially your building assessor, to get a thorough under understanding of um, of your your building and your building envelope and how things are in active um, uh, active um, practice. Um, if it's kind of a, a smaller expansion or maybe you haven't started yet, um, this would be a great time. Um, it would, I think it would be an interesting time to involve some outside perspective in planning an expansion. Um, and again, if, uh, if there are specific instances that we can help you with, um, please feel free to give us a call and we'll talk through your individual expansion needs. Um, the next question is, uh, I work at a university museum and we have art throughout our campus. Would the assessors need to see every building that we have art in? Um, it's a good question. We do a lot of university assessments. Um, a lot of times they like to see as much as possible, yes. Um, it's, you know, sometimes things are in, um, sometimes collections end up in uh, the, um, the president's house or um, places that are not really public spaces. Um, that's okay. They may not need to see all of those places. They would want an understanding of where the art is located. And I would imagine that a lot of their questions would relate to um, how you track where those collections go, how long um, people have it, or how long art is out on exhibition, um, and what steps you're taking to protect um, those pieces that are outside of your control, but I um, or outside of your immediate control. Um, but yeah, it, it, it kind of, it, they want to see as much as they can, but um, don't feel limited by that. So this is similar to one of the other questions, but can the CAP help you prepare for a museum relocation? Um, yes, I think in, in some cases it can. Um, I think you should be cognizant of the limitations of a CAP assessment um, because assessors are only on site for, for uh, two days. They um, may be able to help with um, highlighting um, some of the things that you should be concerned about, um, some of the most vulnerable aspects of your collections. They may say, hey, I know your plan is to um, have your storage on this side of the building, but we really recommend that you switch that up and switch it to the other side. Um, so it, it might be a good time, yes. Let's see. Um, the next question is, is CAP a reimbur reimbursement grant for assessors? So um, it's not a traditional, so it's not a grant um, because none of the funds flow directly to the institution. So um, rather than us providing you with a check, um, what we would do is you would engage in the contract with the assessor. Um, so again, and I'm just going to flip back to my, um, my slide here that talks about that. There we go. Um, what, what we would do is after your assessment is complete, um, your assessor would submit an invoice to both us and you. Um, and the invoice to FAIC would be for $3,900, and the invoice to your museum would be for $500 in this example. So it's not, you don't have to front the $4,400 and then we reimburse you for that. It's the assessor billing us and billing you separately. All right. Um... We also had some questions about how many applications are typically received in a year. Um, that's a good question, um, and one that I can't answer very easily. Um, I, our first year in um, in uh, administering the CAP program was this past one, and we had a really short application period and. Um, not much of a notification period, so we didn't have a lot of time to market it for the 2017 year. So I don't have a lot of information to be able to to tell you, you know, what what percentage of applicants are accepted into the program. Um, I would say if you apply early, so if you apply in November, applications open November 1st. If you can get them in before the end of November, I'd say you have a really great shot. Um, and that is as specific as I will be. <laughs> 
<laughs> so we've also had a few questions asking more information about how you find the assessor and how you match yourself up with an assessor for your institution. Yeah, so um, we provide, FAIC has compiled a list of um, about 65 building assessors and probably closer to 70 collections assessors. Um, there are assessors we've screened to meet our eligibility requirements for assessors, which means that they need to have um, at least five years of work experience in the field. They need to have um, professional training in um, conservation or architecture or whatever field they are, are applying within. Um, and they also have to have experience performing general conservation assessments in the past. Um, we create a comprehensive, um, really crazy spreadsheet. Um, and I don't want to share it with you because it's, it can be confusing um, if you don't get uh, um, a little bit of an introduction to it. But it provides all of the information about all of the assessors in terms of their specialty areas. Um, you know, some conservators focus on paper, some focus on industrial objects. And we encourage you to find one whose specialty areas match the the makeup of your collection. Um, we also provide links to all of their resumes so you can read through all of those. Um, so, And also we provide links to um, some uh, uh, references, so other folks for whom they've worked, so that you can give another museum a call and ask for their opinion on them. So um, we give you a lot of information. We do some initial screening, but we, um, uh, we let you um, find a good match for you, and we're also always help, ha happy to help with that process. So the next question asks, does the full-time staff member have to be within the collections department, I'm assuming? Um, they're asking because they are part-time, but most of the staff are full-time. Oh, that's a great question. Um, yes, we do want, want full-time help on the collections, um, but it could be collections and buildings. So if you have facility staff, um, we view those folks as being integral to the care of your collections. Um, so if you have a housekeeper, that's wonderful. Um, if you have security, if you have um, uh, someone who's responsible for policy development, so probably your executive director or someone like that um, spends time on things that influence the care of the collection. So we. We do want them to be involved in some way. If you're um, a university museum, I'll give that as an example, and you're the only person, you're part-time, and you're the only person that does anything with collections at all, um, and everyone else in the university is uh, uh, is teaching, that, that may be difficult for us to swing. Um, but we can usually come up with a way to find 40 hours at your institution. And if you need help with creativity, um, we've others, so please let us know. Great. So the next question also asks about funding. Um, and it was just wanted to confirm that the, the money goes directly to the assessor rather than being funneled through the museum. That's exactly right. Yes. Okay. So the assessor is paid um, their allocation somewhere between $35 and $3,900 directly from FAIC. And then any additional costs, um, travel costs, or whatever it may be, are paid from the institution. Excellent. So we have a museum who is wondering if we can recommend an organization that may provide a similar services cap, but specifically focuses on audio, visual, or film collections. Um, I may be able to do that, but not off of the top of my head. I'm not that good. I'm sorry. I wish I was. <laughs> Um, let us, um, I'll, I'll check your name here and um, we'll have, if you registered through and pre-registered for the webinar, um, we'll be able to go back and find your email and um, I'll shoot you an email. I, I have an idea, but it's just not coming to me off the top of my head, so I'll send an email link. So the next question asks, does the assessment um, report includes suggestions for funding sources to address various archival needs, procurement, et cetera. Oh, I'm so glad you asked that. Um, right, so the focus of CAP should be um, not only what do you need to do, but what kind of tools might there be to help you with that. 
um, a good CAP assessment does provide um, those types of recommendations when the assessor is familiar with them. Um, so in some cases, there just may not be formal tools um, available or grants or um, other types of funding. Um, Liz has been diligently working on a comprehensive list of grants that are available for um, things that we typically see in CAP recommendations. So conservation funding, um, building care funding, that kind of thing. Um, and you will soon see that on the FAAC um, CAP website under our resources link. Um, and so we try to provide that um, and assessors in the report also should try to provide that uh, as well when it's available. So the so next question, clear, I'm sorry, I just oh, want to follow up. To be clear, we, we don't provide the funding, um, nor can we provide any additional help with getting that funding. Um, but sometimes just um, like Liz talked about earlier, submitting the, um, the CAP report as evidence or as supplemental material in your application um, is extremely helpful. So the next question asked that they are an art museum and they have a library and archive. Would the assessment have to cover those areas or only the art? Um, no, we can, we can um, I think your assessors would want to be aware that the library and archive exist, but the focus of the assessment would be on the museum collections. Excellent. So the next question asks, would CAP be appropriate for assessing the needs, such as a building renovation and collections for moving to a new facility? So it depends on what, again, where you are in the process and what you're, you're expecting out of the assessment. What CAP won't do is create a move plan um, or a, a handling plan um, or, or something like that. Um, what CAP could do is review um, plans that you may have drafted um, or talk to you about, um, you know, here, here are your current, in your current situation, here are your vulnerabilities. If you have this opportunity to, to um, move to a, a new facility, here are the things that you should, um, you should be focused on improving. Um, if it's an existing building, they may be able to say, here are the problems with this existing building. Um, and things that you should fix either before your move or sh shortly thereafter, or things you should work around and be aware of before you move into it. Um, they may also, if it's a brand new building, they may do the same thing looking at uh, construction drawings and saying, hey, this is gonna be a problem, or your HVAC system isn't sufficient, or who knows. Um, it's a little bit more difficult with a non-existing building um, than it would be with an existing structure, um, but it's uh, uh, if it, if the timing is correct, it can it can be done well. But you you have to be in a position to be able to make changes. Um, so if you are not, um, if you know you're not going to be able to make those kinds of adjustments based on the results of the cap assessment, it's probably not going to be helpful to have that assessment. The next question asks if cap can focus on conservation issues only. Yes, um, not sure if I fully understand that. Um, if the if the concern is if by conservation issues um, you mean uh, individual object conservation, so um, I have uh, you know these three paintings and I, they're flaking and I want um, someone to look at them and see what needs to be done to um, to fix the paintings, then. No, CAP is not a, pro a program that does that kind of item by item um, uh, conservation assessment. Um, it's really, like Liz described it, as um, a kind of bird's eye view of preventive conservation measures. So um, what, are your, what is your um, uh, environment? What is the environment like that's housing your collections? Um, what kind of storage materials are you using? Um, is your collection vulnerable to theft, that kind of thing. Um, but if you're looking for um, conservation, um, conservation work and repair, then this is unfortunately not the right program. 
Okay, the next question asks, we are a settlement and our primary purpose is to provide services to the most needy in the community. However, we have an extensive archive in a single room in one of our buildings. We especially need help with those archives. Do we sound like an appropriate match for CAP? Um, so that's really interesting. We've worked with some interesting um, kind of not similar situations, but similar situations in that um, the museum is not um, the primary focus of the organization. So we worked with a theater this year that has a significant art collection. Um, and they do have a, a curator on staff and a collections manager to take care of that. Um, I would want to talk to you more, Paula, about um, uh, about your staff, um, about your archive, and um, you know whether um, whether this is a good fit, or maybe there are some other resources that we could send your way to help. Um, so, Paula, if you don't mind contacting me offline, I'd really appreciate it. Let's see, the next question says, uh, we are both a nature and heritage center. So we have a historic collection and a number of historic buildings in our collection, but we also have an arboretum. We are primarily interested in CAP for our historic collection, but do the assessors need to split their time equally between the nature and heritage components? Um, no, we can focus in this, in this case, um, in most cases, I will say that um, our assessors do wanna look at the collection holistically. Um, it's a little different with um, with sites that have both living and non-living collections, um, only because our budget only has enough funding to focus on a, a small amount. Um, so we're happy if you want to focus on the historic collection. Um, I'm fairly convinced you have um, folks on staff who um, can help you with your, your uh, living collections, and we would be happy to help with the historic section. Great. The next question is, is it possible for the assessment to be conducted in the summer since we are a seasonal museum? Absolutely. We let every museum work with their assessors on their own schedules um, so you can plan your own. Um, and we would just it would just be important for you to make that uh, an important part of your conversation as you're interviewing assessors, um, just to let them know that that's a priority. And I'm just going to jump right in real quick because I, I want to get to, I know there are a couple more questions that I haven't gotten to yet, but I do want to say that um, for those of you who need to leave because we're reaching the end of our hour, um, the uh, recorded version of this webinar will be available on the CAP website, um, hopefully in the next day or two. Um, and um, you can also get it just by emailing us if you can't find it on the website, but I hope you will. Um, so I'm going to keep going on questions here. <laughs> so we have a question that says, "Is it uh, could assessors be able to help determine if artifacts follow the mission statement, or are they only looking at environment and collection storage spaces? Excellent question. I'm, I tend to use um, storage and environment as my examples, and that's not good, and so I apologize. Um, yeah, no, they. I think they can definitely look at do you have a collections policy? Does your policy help you um, with deciding how to accession objects or what, what objects are appropriate for your institution? Um, what they won't do is go item by item. So they're not gonna go through every box in your collection and say, get rid of this, keep this, get rid of this, keep this. Um, but they can help you look at the way your policies are structured. They can talk through the process that you have for accepting new items in the collection. Um, and help point you in the direction of best practices. Wonderful. And finally, we have a collection or a question asking, we are a military museum. What are vehicles count as part of the collection? Um, I would turn that question back on you and say, do you consider the vehicles part of your collection? Um, if they're historic vehicles and you treat them as part of the collection, then yes. Um, we have, we've had several aviation museums participate in CAP. Um, we've had maritime museums um, that have boats that are, um, that are objects in the collection. So in most cases, I would say yes, probably. Um, just because an object is in use, I, I don't know if, you, um, if those vehicles are um, actively used. Um, if either way, 
um, I, I think they could be considered collections items. Great. Um, and so I just, it looks Sorry. I'm sorry. I noticed um, we kind of we had received a, a private message just asking about availability of the slide deck, and um, I could email the slide deck if all you care about are the are the um, slides, but um, the recording will be available on the website. Wonderful. We also okay. have another question that says we have some functioning tanks as part of our collection. Um, so uh, we do have, like, uh, yeah, th so like I mentioned before, um, your collection could include anything that you identify as part of the collection. Um, so it really is up to your institution and um, your collections policy. And someone wanted you to just repeat what the funding allocation was for Yeah, I'll flip back to that slide. So it's right here. So less than $250,000, um, the um, allocation per assessor is $3,900. This should read $250,001 to $750,000 is $3,700. And then over $750,001 should be $3,500 per assessor. Excellent. Well, that looks like it might be the end of the questions. Oh, wait, we might have one more. Nope. <laughs> okay, great. Well, I want to thank everyone for joining us today. Uh, I know I said it a hundred times, but um, if you have additional questions or questions specific to your institution, please give us a call. Um, uh, we'd be happy to, to um, talk through individual scenarios, or if you have questions on the application as you start to fill that out, please also give us a call. Um, we're excited to see so many participants from around the country and are look for, looking forward to some really great applications coming our way here in just about a week.